God of mercy, please come rescue me. Yeah. 
well. I want to put another deposit in that bank of testimonies and tell you a story from when I was a missionary in Mexico. I had lived already in the country 14 years by the time this story happened. It was 2011, and uh, we were in a major city called Monterey, about 6 million people. And in Monterey, there was, a, in that year, a disruption in the way the cartels had organized their crime. And as they were fighting over territory in the ways that organized crime does, there was an, an unbelievable amount of death in the city. Almost 2,000 people died in two, 2011 caught oftentimes wrong place, wrong time between these warring cartels. And it was such a big deal in the city that, I mean, after dark, the taco stands were closed. And when you close the taco stands in Mexico, you are in big trouble. And the evening, like the men's soccer leagues that were happening often till midnight were all closed down. So you're not playing soccer and you're not eating tacos. Something is wrong in the city. And a pastor friend of mine that summer of 2011 woke up and he told his wife that he'd had a dream and in his dream, he'd been praying over some police officers. And she said, I don't think we know any police officers. And he said, no, I feel like the dream was from the Lord. I'm gonna pray that he gives me an opportunity to pray over some police officers. And so everywhere he lo- went in the next month, he was looking for them. And one time he saw them at a restaurant eating lunch, a bunch of, a whole table full of them. And he offered to pick up their tab to the waitress because he, w- he was hoping that would give him an entree to say hi, like, hey, I'm a pastor in town. But when he picked up their tab, those guys thought he was trying to bribe them for something and it didn't, or it didn't end up very well. And so he told the Lord, okay, I'll, I'll stop looking for police officers. Instead, I want you to bring one to me. A month or so later, he was preaching on a Sunday morning, and as he was finishing up his message, an elder came and passed him a note that said, keep everybody inside and safe if you need to, just start all over again, because the building was surrounded by police. And that wasn't that unusual. During that year, we could be at the mall, we could be at the movies, we could be at the grocery store, at the restaurant, and if one of those 2,000 deaths happened in that same square, they would shut everything down. You'd be on lockdown for hours as they did whatever they had to do outside to make it safe again for us to go. And so the, my pastor friend just immediately assumed that there had been some kind of incident outside the church. And as, as a desire to keep his people safe, he just started back again at the beginning of his message. And then somebody passed him a note again, and the message said, you can, you're free to let everybody go. Uh, it's just a security detail. It turns out the chief of police for our community is in attendance in the church. And so he did what we, what, we don't really do this in America, but he said, um, if there's anybody new here this morning, I'd like you to come forward for a prayer of blessing, because he was trying to figure out who, which one was the police chief. 11 people came forward, and he walked down the, the row and prayed a little blessing. And when he got to the head of the man who was the police officer, he felt the Lord say to him, so he whispered in his ear, the Lord has saved your life for the season you are entering now. And then he kept going. After the service, he was so excited. He went up to him. He's like, hey, I've been praying like for over a month now to meet a police officer. And here you are in my church. And like, so I had this dream and I was praying over like a whole force. And I was just wondering like, which, which house do you belong to? And can I come pray over your police officers? And the guy was like, uh, well, I, I am the new chief in this community. You probably know your other chief was murdered last week. I just got here from Cancun and I don't really know anybody yet in the station that I'm serving, but I can't believe I've even met anybody that I think would want you to pray over him. So... Probably not. But my friend was like, no, I'm quite insistent. And so at the end of their discussion, finally this new police chief said, fine, you can come on Saturday mornings. I'll give you five minutes between the evening and morning roll call when the shifts are changing. We make announcements during that time. I'll give you five minutes. You can pray whatever you want to. So my friend went that Saturday to the police station. If you can imagine a city like the size of Chicago, there's like all these kind of suburbs around the city of Chicago, what they call Chicago land. So this is one of those communities. This community is called Guadalupe. It's been census at about a million people. So it's still a really big community to be police, to be the police force there. So he gets to the Guadalupe police station. He gets up, he shares the basics of the gospel. You know, he's like hoping somebody will raise their hand or whatever. At the, at, later that day, I talked to him and I said, how to go over to the police station? He goes, well, nobody, nobody actually responded or even said anything to me. And I said, how are you feeling about that? He's like, I feel great about that. I feel like I did exactly what the Lord asked me to do. In fact, I asked him if I could come back next Saturday. And I said, well, what'd they say? And he said, well... He said, actually, the police chief was like, because that went so well, you'd like to do that again. And he said, yes, I do want to do that again. 
he got them to agree for him to go ahead and he began to share every Saturday morning, week after week, throughout the summer and early fall, just basic stories about Jesus while they stood at attention between their morning and evening day shifts. Finally, it was like early October and in his prayer time and preparing for that, he felt like the Lord told him to bring a worship person with him. And he said, I mean, I only give five minutes, but I'm going to give two and a half of them to the worship leader from the church. So that guy came and he brought his guitar and I asked him afterwards how, how to go with the songs. And he said, well, I mean, nobody's sang along or anything. I don't even think any of those people have ever sang in unison before and they definitely don't know our music. And he said, but I, I got a good feeling about it. We're going to go back next week. Throughout the end of 2011, every Saturday, this worship leader and this pastor would go for five minutes and minister to the police force. Now we're in the beginning of 2012. In January of 2012, as they were all standing there during the worship song, the two and a half minute worship song, one of the sergeants fell over. Now, this is a room of first responders, so they all ran to him because they thought he had had a heart attack. But he had just become overwhelmed in some way by the spirit. And after that five minutes, the chief said to the police officer, I mean, to my pastor friend, he's like, well, I mean, I guess there's probably something happening inside of them, but they don't really know how to talk about it. They don't, they don't really, maybe you're touching something, but they don't have the communication skills or the vulnerability or, the, or even the, feel the freedom to be able to ask questions or tell each other about what's happening. And so here's what I want us to do. It's now February of 2012. I want the month of February, I'd like you to do a leadership class. And why don't you use the person, the biblical character of David and teach them every day about who David was and how he led the people and how he was bold in battle. Because at this point, Mexico had called in the National Guard to our city. We were losing about 23, 24 police officers' lives every single month. It was, the city was on lockdown. And he knew the morale of, the, of his workforce was deteriorating rapidly. And he's like, I think we just need to teach them how to be bold and stand up and be strong. So the month of February, every day, my friend Zaltiel went for almost 30 minutes and taught on the person of David. And on the last day of February, they passed out certificates to everybody for having participated in the, in the leadership course. And the police chief made an announcement that everybody already knew was true, that in the month of February, not a single officer's life was lost. So it wasn't like all those people wanted to like join Bible study or anything, but they definitely wanted like whatever good juju that pastor was bringing to the house to come every day. Like, we don't know who you are, but you need to come and pray over us every day. Something is happening. And if he was here today with you, he would tell you it was March 1st of 2012 that the whole story changed because he realized it was too much for him to do himself. So he called an ecumenical meeting of other Christian evangelical leaders in that Guadalupe community. And he told those pastors, here's what's happening. Here's what I've been doing now since last summer over at the police station. And I'm going to pass around a calendar. They want us to come over there and pray every day. And we're going to go there and pray over those men and women every single day. And I don't want you to invite them to your church. We're going to bring church to them. And like, we're just going to divvy up and share the load. And so throughout March and April and May and June, different pastors were going every day, praying blessings, giving teachings to that police station. And we began to notice in the news that that Guadalupe police station was having unprecedented victory. They were having far more arrests than even the National Guard that had been called in to deal with the cartel war crime that we were facing in the city. And people were starting to notice what's happening in Guadalupe, like just one little community in our great big city. What's going on there? Why is that police station having so much success? By the summer of 2012, the, the, there had been so much positive work done among the peacekeeping forces that we started to eat tacos again after dark and started to play soccer again at night. And things were, headlines were looking better, people were feeling better, the deaths were down, the spirits were high. In the fall of 2012, the community of Guadalupe elected a new mayor. And the mayor called into his office the leaders in the community, the police chief, my friend, the pastor, Salatiel, a bunch of the other um, community leaders. And he said, hey, so like I just got elected and one of the first things I have to do officially is give the keys of the city to somebody. And I'm, I, I know that you all get credit for what's been happening. So just decide amongst yourself, who would you like to represent the work that you've been doing now in this last year? Who would you like to give credit for and get the keys to the city? And my friend said, 
you, you'd like to know who gets credit for what's been happening in this city? And uh, the mayor said, yeah, I would. He said, well, that would be Jesus Christ. And the mayor's like, you'd like my first political act to be to give the keys of the city to Jesus Christ? Like, <laughs> and he said, well, if you're looking for who it is that gets credit for what's been happening in this community, that's absolutely where it belongs. So in case you thought I was making it all up, I brought a video to show you of what happened when the mayor of Guadalupe gave the keys of the city to Jesus Christ. Es por eso que hoy yo, César Garza Villarreal, presidente municipal de Ciudad Guadalupe, entrego la ciudad de Guadalupe, Nuevo León, a nuestro Señor Jesucristo. The community went crazy. They continued cheering like that for about 12 straight minutes kind of a little bit like a Taylor Chapel, and <clears throat> now that I think about it. And here's what happens at these official events. In the front row sit the, sit the dignitaries of the other communities. So like the, the mayor of this community and this community and this community, they're all in the front row. They go to their, each other's like things. And when they watch the people of Guadalupe go crazy for Jesus Christ, they're like, hey, my, my key thing is next week, I'm giving my keys to Jesus Christ. Like, <laughs> And so by the end of 2012, all of these communities had given the keys of their cities over to Jesus Christ, and you could feel the revival that was coming in the town. Now we're into January of 2013, and there was one municipality that had not, impa- had not participated in any way with what God was doing in the city, and that was the city proper. About 1,400 officers um, policed that community. And in January of 2013, the chief of the Monterey Police Force called my pastor friend and asked him what he was doing the next Saturday morning, and was he interested in addressing his people for about five minutes. And so afterwards, I said to him, like, how'd it go? He's like, well, they all stood at detention the whole time and no, nobody like raised their hand or even talked to me afterwards. And I said, are you discouraged? He's like, no, I'm gonna wait like six weeks and bring a guitar with me. <laughs> In July of 2013, the mayor of Monterey stood on the steps of our city hall and in front of a nationally televised audience read an entire chapter out of the book of Isaiah and dedicated the entire city over into the hands of Jesus Christ and not everybody who saw it understood what was happening our headline the next day said if you turned on your water and it tasted like wine you can thank the mayor (laughs) I mean people didn't know what was happening but you could feel what was going on in the community as we talk this week about Psalm 27 what it means to wait upon the Lord what it looks like sometimes waiting means in the middle of things that are chaotic that are dark that God calls us into those places. I was interviewed last week on something and the question that I got asked was, because I do some international travel, they first said, you know, something along the lines like, man, everything's getting worse, it feels like by the day, and they they rattled off a couple of statistics that talks about how dark the world is getting. And they said, how are you feeling about that? I said, I'm not feeling anything like what you're talking about. I've got all kinds of hope going on in my heart about what God is doing in the world. And they said, where is it that you're seeing God move in the world? And I think they expected me to say something like about a community in Africa or about someplace I've been in Central America. I said, you wanna know where I see God's spirit moving in the world right now? I see it in American students. This is the place that I see God's spirit moving. You cannot believe how encouraged the church is around the world by what they see happening in American high school and college students. And I want to to affirm to you all that this is right in the center of of God's will. He's been telling this story for a really long time. I got a bunch of things here for us to look at. And I want... uh, I wanna tell you a story that starts in the book of Genesis chapter one, and we know the most recent story is here in September of 2024. It's a repeating pattern, and wherever you are, the rest of your life, I want you to remember this pattern, because sometimes people will say things like, I don't know how it got so bad. Like, I don't even know what to do anymore. Here is exactly what to do. God has given us this pattern, so we know where it is that we can step in. In the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, 1, right? It says, the the earth was formless and empty. Today, we talked a little bit about that Hebrew word, chutzpah. I'm going to teach you two more Hebrew words. Who cares if you remember them? It doesn't matter if you know how to say them or spell them. I want you to picture them in your brain. Formless is tohu. Empty is velohu. 
But when you put them together, tohu vavalohu, it means something bigger than just formless and empty the way we translated them in English. I was thinking on the way here because I drove here from Ohio. If I said the word scarlet, you might get a picture in your mind. And if I say the word gray, you might get a picture in your mind. But if I say scarlet and gray together, you're going to say what? Okay, yeah, for the fellow bug guys in the house. Okay, so in the same way that scarlet and gray means, so, I know, I'm so sorry, Michigan people. I just could, maize and blue doesn't have the same sound to it, so I just, okay. Okay, but what I want you to, I know. Okay, so big. That's, do not make that the biggest reaction we have tonight. Okay, here we go. Tohu vavalohu, together formless and empty means total chaos. And in our Bibles, you will see chaos represented by water, exactly like it was in Genesis chapter one. So here's my water bottle that represents tohu or chaos. And in the midst of that chaos, we see Genesis one, the spirit of God hovers. And I brought this fan to represent God's spirit. I mean, what, what do you get to represent God's spirit? But the word in Hebrew for spirit is ruah and the word for wind and spirit is ruah. So I thought spirit, wind, fan, this is my idea. Over chaos, God's spirit always hovers. He's not afraid of tohu. He's not afraid of chaos. And every time in every pattern we'll see throughout scripture, chaos, God's spirit hovers, and then God speaks. So my Bible represents God speaking because this is what he said. And in Genesis 1, he said, let there be, right? Let there be animals and light and day and night and all the things that happened. And after God speaks, always without exception, peace breaks out. Shalom comes. So this is my attempt at, um, I'm sorry to the landscaping of Taylor because I ripped this up. <laughs> this is my attempt at like, like an like a olive branch or like this, this represents peace, okay? God's peace, God's peace always comes after God speaks. And if only we could stay in that peaceful place, that would have been amazing. But as we know from the story in the Garden of Eden, in the midst of the shalom that came with creation, the next thing that happened is the temptation came. And if they had resisted this apple, they would have stayed in peace, but they didn't. They bit the apple and the whole story starts again. And now we're in the book of, or now we're still in Genesis, but we have the story of Noah and everything Tohu was so crazy. Chaos was so crazy that God decided to flood the earth and start again. So we have water again, representing all that crazy Tohu. And then God's spirit after the, you know, Noah and the ark and 40 days and 40 nights, God's spirit comes, it blows, that Ruah blows that, that water dry and the, and the spirit of God hovers like a dove, comes down on that chaos, on that boat. And then God speaks. He's like, Noah and your people get out, be fruitful and multiply. And as soon as God speaks, peace breaks out and it's like amazing and there's a rainbow and it's like a most beautiful peaceful scene you've ever seen if only they would have stayed there but no it didn't he got drunk in that tent and he cursed people and it, it was a big fat mess and because someone ate the apple we're back here again in tohu we're back here again in chaos now we're in the book of exodus right you have the story of moses you got babies being thrown into the water remember the water represents chaos Babies being thrown in the water, it's terrible. God's kids are enslaved, it's terrible. Chaos is terrible. And God comes and he hovers and he blows open, that spirit of God blows open that Red Sea and God tells Moses, raise your right arm. You take my people, you let my people go. You free my people. And they walk through that parted Red Sea on God's word and shalom broke out. And we read in, in Exodus chapter 15, they begin to sing and dance what the Bible calls Miriam's song. And it's unbelievable. And they get manna and he talks to them on the top of the mountain. It's unbelievable. And you know how long it lasts until they make that golden calf. They complain their way through the next 40 years. They bit the apple and chaos resumes again in the land and among God's people. And now we're in the story with Moses' uh, predecessor, Joshua, successor, sorry, the other direction, success, Joshua. Joshua tells the story about how they are against a swollen Jordan River. So now you know whenever you see water, there was chaos. And Joshua had to lead his people on the other side so they could go to Jericho where God was leading them to go. And, and, but there was, they couldn't get across the river. Chaos. 
So God's spirit came, he opened up that river, it stood up on end, God told them to put your big foot in there, walk across it, I'm gonna be there. It was unbelievable, and that's an awesome story if you've never read it, about how the water stood up in, in the Jordan and God's kids walked through and they were like singing and it was amazing and it lasted like a hot second till they took Jericho, which God told them to, and then they kept for themselves everything that God said was his. And because they bit the apple, we were right back here. And if this was an all-night class, we're only in you know, the beginning of the book. We could do this all day long. But I want to take you to the New Testament, to Matthew chapter 3. And in Matthew chapter 3, you see Jesus is on the side of the Jordan River, and he's about to be baptized. But now we know when we see water what it means. And when Jesus saw Tohu, when he saw water, did he say, I'm going to stay as far away from it as possible? He's a water enterer. He's a goer to her, the chaos. He enters into that water, and the Spirit of God came and hovered over top of it. It says it in the book of Matthew. And then God spoke. What did he say? This is my son with whom I love and whom I am well pleased. And as soon as he said that, shalom broke out and blind people could see and deaf people could hear and deaf people got rose from the dead and it was unbelievable. And then in the very next chapter, temptation comes Jesus' way, but here's what happens this time. He doesn't bite the apple and the binding of the evil one begins. And I think sometimes when we see that passage in Matthew 3, Jesus getting baptized, we think like, well, maybe he did that so like we would all know like that's what you're supposed to do when you're a Christian. Like, maybe. But I think it was a training moment for those disciples. If you want to follow me, we're going to go into the water. We're not afraid of the chaos. We're going to enter into the tohu. We're going to look for his spirit. We're going to listen to his voice and we're going to hold on to his peace and then we're going to resist temptation. So sometimes when I was getting ready to speak at a church recently and uh, the night before on the Saturday night, there was a shooting in that city and it had impacted one of the members of that community. So when I got there on Sunday morning, they said, hey, I know you like already have some prepared remarks, but it, probably you just should at least address that this congregation is grieving because someone was shot last night innocently. And and as I was talking to people getting ready for the service, what people kept saying is like, well, I don't even know what to do. I, I don't even know where to start. That's what I want you to hear me, loud and clear. Taylor community, when you see chaos and you're like, I don't know what to do, here's what you do, you go into it. You enter into the waters. We have nothing to be afraid of. God has given us every tool we need to look for his spirit, to listen to his voice, to hold on to his peace, and to resist his temptation. There's a story in Mark chapter four. Jesus is standing on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm gonna talk just to you for a few minutes because I forgot you for a second. In the edge of the Sea of Galilee. And he says to his disciples, we're gonna go on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And that phrase, the other side, was something that represented on the other side is where people don't have anything to do with me. They don't live religiously. They live like the Greek and the Romans and they have practices that would scare you. They were so dark. It was a tohu environment on the other side. It was chaotic in every sense. And Jesus says to his disciples, we're gonna cross across the water, which we already know now, water represents the abyss, it represents chaos. And we're gonna go over there to the other side where those people don't want anything to do with me. And all we see in our Bibles is that the disciples do what they say, what God, Jesus says. We don't really know like, were they thinking to themselves, I don't really wanna go across the abyss to those people over there that maybe don't even wanna hear what it is that we have to say. Today we know the people on the other side were worshiping the gods of fertility and wine, so you can imagine what their spiritual renewal looked like over there, right? Okay. <laughs> but Jesus, he got into the boat, entered into that water, he got halfway across the abyss, and you know what the abyss, what that darkness, what that chaos did to that boat and to those disciples and to Jesus? It did exactly what it'll do to you every time you tell Jesus yes. Every time you say yes to an assignment to go into chaos and to be a shalom bringer, to be someone who resists temptation and follows God's voice and looks for his spirit, every time you go into the water, it will kick itself up in your face. And that's exactly what happens in Mark chapter four. It comes in the form of this huge storm. And Jesus teaches us exactly what to do when Tohu comes for us. He silenced it with the words out of his mouth. These words that we have access to right now. Again, if we were here all night, we would talk about how that is an exact reenactment of what happened with Jonah. 
right? Jonah was in a boat. He saw the, the other side. He saw Nineveh was doing all the wrong things. And God asked him to be a shalom bringer and to bring his message. He's like, I don't want anything to do with that over there. And he ran away from chaos, got into a boat, fell asleep. And people said to him, like, aren't you going to do anything about this? Jesus is in that exact same situation. And the disciples are like, aren't you going to do anything about this? He's like, absolutely, I'm going to do something about this. Darkness has nothing on us. Chaos has nothing on us. You have my words. My words will silence it. He silences the storm. He gets to the other side. Mark chapter 5, it says that he gets met there by this um, demoniac, this like demon-possessed man. Talk about tohu. Talk about chaos. The guy like was still alive, but his people had already chained him up to a graveside as if he was not even, a, like his life wasn't even worth it. But breaking from those chains, he met Jesus. He was unclean, he was naked, he was bleeding and there were a bunch of pigs around. That is the very definition in the first century of tohu and chaos. Jesus takes one look at him he understands the power he carries inside of him, the same power he's given all of us. And he says to those demons to get out and get to get into those pigs. Those pigs go flying off that cliff. I want you to hear me loud and clear. Our Bibles never say the disciples got out of the boat when Jesus did. Those, Bible, those disciples sat in the boat while 2,000 demon-possessed pigs came flying over their heads. <laughs> like, next time, get out, follow Jesus. Then that, that demoniac said to Jesus, uh, hey, can I go with you? Like, I've never felt quite like this before. Can, is it, can I go with you? And everything in me wants Jesus to say yes. But you know what? He's going to send him out. And where's he going to send him? Back into the chaos. And what's he going to send him to do? Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. He's going to send him back to tell the story of what God has done. It says in Mark chapter 5, Jesus was getting back into the boat. The man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him, but Jesus didn't let him. He said, go home to your own people. Go back to your tohu. Tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And so the Lord went away and he began to tell in Decapolis, that, that, that other side, that place full of people in chaos, he began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and all the people were amazed. And then Jesus Got back in the boat, he went back across that abyss and he went back home to Capernaum. And the first time my heart wrapped itself fully around that truth, I thought to myself, Jesus did all of that abyss crossing, storm silencing, chaos entering for only one person. And it wasn't even like the most important person over there. It was like the least likely, most unwanted person in that community. He is not afraid of darkness. He is not afraid of chaos. I was getting ready, this is my last story for you this evening. I was getting, um, I had one of those weeks where it felt like darkness was coming for me. Do you ever have one of those weeks where it's just like, it's like impacting your mind and your relationships and your body and you're just like, oh, I feel under attack. I had one of those weeks. I just felt under attack. And my husband was getting ready to go to our site in India and I was, I was just talking to him the night before he left and honestly, I was kind of complaining. Like, oh, please don't go. Just stay here with me. Like, I like fighting with you better against this devil. I, I like it when we pray for, I pray for you and you pray for me. And I like, I like feeling like we're in this together. That the work that we do that is opposed, we can face, you remind me of biblical truths. And so he was like, well, I mean, I guess I don't have to go help the orphans tomorrow in India. But like, <laughs> and we were really honestly trying to have this discussion whether we should do it or not. And then finally I was like, fine, go help them. I'll be okay. I know the truth, right? that he that is in me is greater than he that's in the world. The next morning, he left to go to India. It takes 24 hours to get there. And that morning, the next morning, I was trying to remember a verse I had heard someone teach one time before. You know how like you remember it kind of, but you don't remember where it was. And I knew the verse talked about how the, the darkness can't harm you. Evil can't harm you. That you, you have too much, you have God in you. And I was looking for it and I finally found it. It's in Luke chapter 10. These are red letters in our Bibles where Jesus told us this directly. He said, I've given you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. And I wrote that down on a note card and I stuck that on my Instagram and I memorized it that day and I told all my children and I reminded them that it doesn't matter what attack we may feel, we've been given authority to enter the waters. 
We don't have to be afraid. Nothing can harm us. The next morning I woke up and he had sent me a message. It takes 24 hours to get from Cincinnati to where we serve in India. And I don't want this to scare any of you who have a call in your life to serve in India, but the community that we have there, the, the place where we have children, uh, residential housing for orphans and vulnerable children, they had had a king cobra outbreak. And so uh, we had to hire king cobra catchers. Who, like who has that major? I don't know, but like we had to hire them to come on our campus and catch the king cobras. And here's a little Nat Geo for you tonight. King cobras are afraid of their own cartilage, specifically a piece of cartilage that's found behind their ear. And if you show a snake that, pe- that little stone, that little piece of cartilage, it submits to it. And the king cobra catchers put that behind them, the snake and then the snake goes back in, the, in whatever they are trying to catch it in. And so as Todd was telling me about this on the phone, I'm like, they're afraid of this like little rock, like, why does everybody not carry that rock in their pocket? Like that, that, there is an opportunity there, I think for some strong sales, but anyway. And he was talking about how in our discussion before he left, we were talking about of all the tools we have in our tool belt when darkness tries, when the tohu tries to come for us, the most powerful gift we have been given is the name of Jesus. And that if we don't know what else to say or do, we just say the name of Jesus, it's strong. And I was in the privacy of our little conversation, like, are you sure that's enough? It's only five little letters, isn't there? Like, shouldn't I be saying like a whole passage? And should I fast first and take communion while I do it and pray with my hands in the air? Like, are we sure that just the name of Jesus is enough to make darkness flee? We were having that discussion. He, he, he took this, he's like, Beth, I videoed them catching the snake. And I was watching it submit to this little tiny rock. And as I watched the snake submit, I thought about our discussion. And I want you to know when you use the name of Jesus, that snake in our garden has to go back in the bag. He has no authority over us. And so I brought a video for you to see it, okay? But no nightmares tonight, please. <laughs> I put my testimony in your bank of testimonies because I want you to remember when that snake comes for you, it will respond to the name of Jesus and it has to go back in the bag. I want this community, yes, yes. Spiritual renewal is about what God is going to do in each of us this week, but it's also about what he's preparing us to go do out there in his name. And I want you to know he has asked this community to enter into the waters. He has called you to the front lines. This is what disciples do. And I pray in the name of Jesus that we do it with boldness, without fear. Certainly we know where that snake needs to go. Would you pray with me? Jesus, I, gosh, thank you for setting us an example. We don't need to be afraid of the storm. May this community learn to look for your spirit, to listen and obey your voice, to celebrate and tell the stories of your shalom and your peace, and to together learn how to resist temptation. Call us forward. We're ready. Take us to the chaos so that we might represent you, the ultimate shalom bringer. Jesus, it is with the authority I have as a co-heir with you that I ask you release an anointing on this body that even still tonight, the conversations that you stir in and among this community change our trajectory forever. And I pray these things in your holy and precious name. Amen.